wanted to record what I can remember of the Kiwani Corporation. Uh, Kiwani, um, and I'm going to be doing so while I am converting um, six mortise cylinders into longer lengths, uh, is what we're going to be doing. Uh, actually, it's going to be five, because apparently for this job I don't have... I don't have the thumb turn yet, so we're going to put this one aside since I can't do that one today. So it's, I guess it's a two, two and one. Um, we'll, we'll convert these cylinders to uh, longer lengths, and then as I'm doing it, I'm going to talk about Kiwani um, and what they were and what they did, etc. So just to let you know what you're watching, first of all, you're going to be watching me convert okay so this client um, this client needed five mortise cylinders two inch length getting those from Schlage is not a problem but they have a substantial upcharge um, for cost for long lengths it is it is a substantial upcharge. It's hundreds of dollars, and the lead time is always equally substantial. So <clears throat> we gave the client the option of not only factory original um, cylinders, but an option for us to convert them. And there are, you know, this is not the first video I've made of doing this. We're going to start out with this uh, Kaba Ilko 7205, which means it's an inch and a quarter cylinder. Uh, it's in a Schlag C keyway, and it has a number one cam, which is just a standard cam. It's satin chrome, and these are key to like is what they are. So I don't know if the client wants key to like, but that's what they're getting. So all five cylinders will be key to like, which very likely is going to be a good thing. No one has addressed with the client, though, <clears throat> that fact. Does he want them all key to like? They very likely do not. Um, so before I ship these on Monday, uh, it's a Saturday right now which is evidenced, um, yeah, which is, it's Saturday right now. I'm going to communicate to the client and find out how they want them keyed. Um, and also confirm the cam. That's a standard cam. That may not be what the client wants. Um, so I'm just going to go about doing all this work. We've got inch and a quarter cylinders. We've got three quarter inch major extensions. Uh, those will get screwed to the back of the mortise cylinder, and then I have the drive cams that are necessary to make all that work. So I'm going to methodically go about doing this as I talk about my recollections of the Kalani Corporation. The two don't go together, mortise cylinders and the Kalani Corporation, but nonetheless. Um, I started in this industry in... Um, the first Monday in December, 1990, whenever, whatever, whatever date that was, December 3rd or whatever it was, and I started that first day sweeping, brushing, shoveling snow off the roof because I was 20 years old and I knew, I knew nothing. I knew no more about door hardware than anyone else. Um, except, you know, that my family was in the door hardware business, of which I'm the fourth generation. So, very, very late 1990, I began working uh, in the family hardware store, selling um, commercial building products. And the history of the family business, my great-grandfather's name was Stanley Howard, and... It was started in the late 1930s, and the history of what was sold in the family business uh, was most definitely an evolving one. Hollow metal doors, uh, I don't believe, well, I don't know when they would have come in terms of popularity, in terms of stocking them, but the fact of the matter is, at some point, most definitely, I'd have to say the 1970s, if I recall what my grandfather said, um, they started carrying hollow metal doors and frames. My grandfather said to me, you know, someone called in asking for these steel doors and I didn't want anything to do with it. But they kept asking. The same guy kept coming in over and over again. So he decided to make a call. 
And it turns out Kiwani was extremely receptive to the idea of there being a Chicago distributor for their product. And my grandfather said, well, you know, I decided to go all in. I ordered six doors, three oh seven oh's, three left hand and three right hand frames. And I thought, wow, that's that's a leap. That's a leap of faith. Uh, but the bottom line is it 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 that turned into a very large um, I recall uh, the name, a very large contractor called Pepper Construction. They are most definitely um, national. I don't know if they were only a Chicago-based outfit, but someone from Pepper would come in and he'd order four door doors and frames right over the counter, and we would write the ticket up, we'd detail everything, we would pull out the hinges, whatever other hardware that the client asked for, We'd give them that hardware, and uh, we would say, "Meet us on, you know, meet us on the side. Uh, go to the overhead door, and that's what the client would do. We'd load up the doors and frames, and that would be that." Well, what I didn't realize at that time at all was those were E-series doors. Kawani made different series of doors, and their E door is like the Seiko Regent door in that it is a. Um, lock seam um, where there is the lower pan of the door and it's folded over and it locks into the upper pan and that design quite frankly is considered um, economy is, is what it's considered Just showing it very, in a very um, crude way, kind of what a lock seam looks like, a lock seam edge door. And they were E420s are what is what they were. Maybe some E418s. It was an E-series door. It was four for inch and three quarter because Kiwani did a lot of work in residential markets where they did <clears throat> um, uh, inch and three eighths doors and frames. Kiwani was always an unequal rabbit. An unequal rabbit is because you could put, you could take your press brake and the way that the machine has been set up, and without resetting anything, do doors for either, in, do frames for either inch and three quarter or inch and three eighths. So unequal rabbit is for that purpose. And those were E418s uh, or E420s, four for inch and three quarter. And then it was eight, uh, 20 for 20 gauge or 18 gauge. Those were honeycomb corridors back then. I highly doubt any options were available in terms of uh, core in the sense of my grandfather likely didn't, was very, my great grandfather didn't get involved in this stuff at all. So when I say my grandfather, I mean my dad's dad uh, because he was, him and my his his brother, my uncle Junior, they um, and my uncle George, my great uncle George, my great grandmother's brother, my the founder's brother-in-law. Um, those guys were the were the sales makers in the company, <clears throat> and but my grandfather wasn't looking to make things complicated, so I doubt that he would have been in, interested in stocking polystyrene or probably polyurethane back then or if the E-Series door was even offered anything other than honeycomb, it may not have been. It may not have been. Um, I just don't know because I, I don't know. Uh, when I started in 1990, I think they still made the E-Door. And it was basically being discontinued at that time or had just been relatively recently discontinued. Um, is what it was. But it was an economy grade door. What Kawani offered... and, and my information that I'm sharing with you is not absolute. It's just my memory. You know, I, I could definitely be wrong um, about about this stuff because I'm sp some of it I am speculating. But my memory serves or tells me that they didn't make a they didn't have any other door other than the E door, which was the economy grade door, or the D door, the D series. The E door, as I said, was that lock seam door, and it was um, intended for low cost. And what does what does that mean, low cost? Well, it means that the guy selling the door wants to make money, so he's going to order a cheap door. And that certainly, in my opinion, would have been the case for why they would have stocked an E420, a 20-gauge honeycomb lock seam edge door. They wanted to make money. They wanted to be, have profit on that. 
Um, however, the D-series door was the exact opposite in terms of its construction. If the E-series door was the cheapest door you can get your hands on, the D, the D door was the Cadillac. It was um, going to be available in a with very heavy reinforcements in the edge, and it is going to be a door that is uh, welded down the vertical styles. Before other people were making it popular, Kawani Standard was a welded edge door, a beveled welded edge door. <clears throat> and um, as soon as you picked up that door, even in an 18 gauge, you knew it was not a standard 18 gauge door. The reinforcements for the hinges were continuous, um, extremely robust and substantial. I love the I love the D door. It was like you're getting a door curated just for your job. Of course, with the D door, you could do all of the options. You could do um, polyurethane. You could do. Um, I don't know if polystyrene was an option, I just don't know. Uh, insulated doors were polyurethane back then before it was realized they're destroying the environment, I, I, from what I understand. Um, you could most absolutely order that door in heavier gauges. 16 and 14 gauge would be not unusual for a D-series door because that was the Cadillac door. You wanted the heaviest duty that Kawani made, it was going to be a D door. Okay. So I've got all the parts pulled out, I'm going to... Um, scooch down and I'm going to pick up um, my tools that I need to get this job started. Okay, I had to slide over and get my um, my tool, my major, my MCE 100. Uh, this is basically a tool that's going to allow me to properly align my holes that I'm drilling in the back of the mortise cylinders and then it's a it's a it's a guide for drilling the holes in the proper location and it is also a guide for tapping the holes Well, so the D-Series door was one needless to say that wasn't sold very often or even stocked, and there may have been, if I recall correctly, an absolute resistance to the door because of its cost. Um, and when I started in 1990, from what I can recall, the E, the e door had been discontinued. Why do they put them on so tight? I don't know how many pounds of force they put these screws on, but it's been a chronic problem with with these with Kaba. The screws are on so tight. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I've had to drill these screws out. I've wanted to buy a screwdriver that has a that has the ability to tell you how many pounds of force, just so I can tell them. I've got to dial the machine down. Okay. So, and the bottom line is these had the cams have to come off. The um, in 1990 when I started, I believe the E series door had just been discontinued and replaced with the V Max V hyphen M A X V Max. I don't know if Kawani invented the VMAX style of door or if they copied it from someone. I just don't know. I'm sure they, if I was going to guess, I would say that they were not the originators of a VMAX type door. The VMAX is the name of, or was the name, I'm not, I, I don't know, of Fred Pippin's boat. And Fred Pippin was the owner of Kawani. An extremely um, business savvy, very nice, very likable person very accommodating 
he had been a his uh, formal training was in a, uh, he was a CPA, uh, but he he said the first time I met him in his office in Kiwani, uh that now it uh, because he had gotten out of accounting, CPA had now stands for cleaning pressings and alterations, is what is what Fred Pippin said, and. Um, and that's how the VMAX store got its name. It was named after his boat. It was a sailboat. And from what I understood, he kept it, at least for a certain amount of time, at the Chicago Yacht Club. And what's interesting about that is Fred also had season's tickets to the Bull uh, Bears, Chicago Bears. And... Uh, there was one more than one occasion that he invited us to come down to the yacht club, have brunch, and then we would take a shuttle bus over to Soldier Field and have the football game. Well, if you know anything about football, that generally occurs when it's happening in Chicago, when it is extremely cold outside. So, uh, and of course, the days that were available were the coldest of days, but nonetheless. We went at least twice. Very much enjoyed his hospitality. As I had said, a very nice man. Owner of Kiwani. Um, yep. And I'm just finding an alternative, trying to find an alternative way to get these off. I've really got to talk to them about why in the gospel is it so tight? I shouldn't need a screwdriver the size of the Thor of Hammer to get these off. Uh, a screwdriver the size of Thor's hammer. I'm trying to say. I realize the screwdriver that I'm using is quite small, but... So... Fred was a... Uh, and I'm sure that he still is. I haven't spoken to him in many years. I, I I expect he's still with us. I just I don't know for sure. He was not that old when I knew him. So the VMAX door is what we're talking about. And the VMAX door, that was a square edge door and that was a paradigm shift uh, compared to the D series the D series was a beveled edge door what does that mean what that means is if you have a beveled edge door unless you had a Kiwani six foot eight where the hinge locations were symmetrical from the top and the bottom and you had a cap that you could insert into the door itself into the top of the door which let me back up the D-series door had a flush top cap and it had an inverted bottom channel. It's just the way it was made. So unless you had a Kiwani 6.8 where the top of the door to the center of the 161 is 39 and 9 16 and the overall height of the door is 79 and 1 8 and if you take 39 and 9 16 and double that it's 79 and an eighth and unless you had a situation where the top of the door to the top of the first hinge was seven and a quarter, and then 37 and five sixteenths, 
and um, 67 and 3 8 which if you measure from the bottom of the door to the top of or to the bottom of each hinge you'd have the same dimensions so regardless of the fact that it was beveled edge you could flip it over it would work as long as you had a top cap that you could put into the top of the door or if your customer didn't care that it was an inverted top cap but you don't want that because it's a natural and obvious way for water to come into the door and if you ever notice a door that's rusted where is it rusted who takes notice of these things well door 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 people do um, it's always rusted at the bottom if you got a rusted door it's a it's a seco regent honeycomb door is what it is every time not every time but you'll see those very often um, Now, if you had a 7.0 D-door, well, Kalani's hinge locations were equidistant from either end. Measure it from the top to the top or the bottom to the bottom of each hinge. Doesn't matter. Hinge locations are the same. However, that lock location is not in the same, not in the right dimension or the right location. So because you have a beveled edge door, you can't flip that over end for end. Uh, there's just no way to do it. This is the perfect tip, and I'm going to put this in my tool so that when I have to do this again and go home and get my Kaba Ilko Voodoo doll and stick pins in it for how hard they make it to remove those screws. All right, uh, I'm going to put these tools away because I won't be needing them, and I find if I don't keep a clean job site, it gets awfully chaotic. Well, along comes the VMAX door. And again, whoever invented the idea basically made the life a lot easier for distributors because distributors didn't care so much whether or not the door was beveled or square edge, even though a beveled door is superior in every regard. That three degree bevel, that one eighth for every two inches gives you the, a nice relief uh, to the edge of the door, most definitely on the lock side. Now, old timers will tell you if there are any old timers left, you don't need to put a bevel on the hinge side, that's just fine. The lock side is where you need it. And I say, well, true, I guess, except if you have a twisted hinge jam, you're going to be really happy for that bevel. So the D door was beveled on both styles, the V Max was square edge. Now, the other difference there is the hinge prep in the D-door was like a standard, typical hinge prep. It's going to have a quarter inch back set, okay? The door is made for the handing that you're working on. Uh, and that's just how that is. Well, you can't have that if you've got a square edge non-handed door. That door has to be prepped that hinge has to be cut all the way through. And then what you need on there are hin handing plates. They're not handing plates, they're just fillers. And what they do is they stack behind the hinge itself and then give you the effect of having a door that's prepped like a D door, where it's you know, your D series door hinge prep is gonna look like that. Or your hinge is going to sit in here. Okay, that's quarter inch back set that you have here. Quarter inch back set. Well, your V Max. That's going to be a square edge door, and that's just going to be cut. Where your hinge is going to sit in here. But then that plate is going to have a goofy little hiccup to it, like this. And those plates are always attached to the edge of the door. That's how that would work. So you never needed to flip the door end for end. All you needed to do was take it from a left hand and put it into a right hand orientation. You never turned the ends over. 
And let me tell you, that was a slam dunk. That that VMAX door was nice. V uh, V V418. Um well I'm I'm not I'm second guessing myself. That may have been a VM418. Just a VMAX. VM418? Or V VM. I forget what we used to call it, what they used to call it. Uh, so you had a door that was non-handed, square-edged. Flush top cap, inverted bottom cap. Why inverted bottom cap? Well, because you're able to, um, the, the end user, if he's got a flooring problem, you might get the door from 90 degree and swing that out to 75 degree, and all of a sudden the door is hitting the concrete. Well, that guy's going to take that door off those hinges, and he's going to put it on a bench, and he's going to grind the bottom of the door and solve that problem. Because it's an inverted bottom channel, you can do that. So the inverted bottom channel is nice. Anyway, about the flush top cap, that's where water gets in. Water will come down. Here's your header. Here's your door. That water has a tendency to, here's the wall cross section. Rain just hits this. It just comes down. That water has a tendency to get in here, lip inside of here, and just pull and collect. Runs all the way down the door till it gets down to the bottom. Pulls and collects here. So when you see rusted doors, you see them rusted at the bottom. That's not where the water came from. It came from up here. What's the, what's the square foot area of the wall above there? Dozens of feet? You know, what if you've got a movie theater and it's, you know, 40, 40 feet tall? You've got, you know, a six foot opening. You know, six times 40, you got 240 feet of collection of water to be able to get down. You should always add a drip cap. Always add a drip cap. That, that prevents that water from coming back. But anyway, the flush top cap is nice because it helps do that. And you can also order doors that have that sealed. Well, the water would pool and collect down at the bottom, and that's where the rusting happens. Same with the frame. Have to collect some more supplies. So with the VMAX door, you didn't need to flip it end, end for end. It just didn't matter anymore. Um, so once you get get yourself into a situation where. You have um, a D series door. I lost my I hit a pothole. I'm sorry. The D series door was then relegated to those applications where it was a specified door, meaning you had a, a, a government specification, not a government. You had an architectural specification that called out for a particular type. Of door construction and the VMAX uh, may not have met that requirement. It's just the bottom line. Square edge door. Now, how do they make a square edge door, you ask? Well, I can tell you about that. Square edge door would have had two pans a top pan and a lower pan. That's how they did that. You'd have your, oh, I don't recall if they did honeycomb. Um, yeah, it was definitely a VM418. Polystyrene would have been standard. Your hinge reinforcements would have been in here. 
I don't recall if they would have welded that closed. They may have. I don't see why Kiwani would not have done that. But it's going to be a door that's got an upper and lower pan, square edged, like that. So the VMAX door really made distribution concerns super easy because now I don't have to keep lefts and rights. Obviously for the frames you have to keep lefts and rights, but not for your doors. No more. You stock VMAX, you stock VM418s, polystyrene, 86 edge, 161, maybe rim panic uh, reinforced, maybe some with deadbolts, you know, whatever. You know, later on when, when continuous hinges in the, in the early 90s were something that I became aware of, um, and people wanted to use full surface, and then and that was fine. Everyone loved those, lifetime warranty. And then later on, we realized, well, those are awfully ugly. How about a mortised version? And then you could possibly have ended up keeping a 35 and 9 sixteenths net width door um, for a continuous hinge. And that would have been really nice if you had... Um, a beveled edge on that when you're doing that sort of work. I have to grab my drill. So once we started bringing in VMAX doors, it was more of a it was, it was simply a situation of, what's the gauge? We know it's polystyrene. You bring them all in fire rated. All of them are going to have a label on them. That doesn't mean that every door left with a label on them, but you're going to order them all fire rated. 18 gauge, some 20 gauge, because we'd have customers that were, they didn't care if it was made out of shipping containers. They wanted the cheapest door they can get their hands on. Um, and then you had your sizes. You know, we would always keep 20, 24, 26, 28, 210, most definitely, 30, 3436, 3840, in 68 and 70. And then in 80s, yeah, we'd have some, we'd have a half a dozen 40s, and we'd certainly have a half a dozen 30s. And those were 18 gauge, and they were polystyrene, and they were prepped for hinges and a cylindrical lock. We sold a lot of filler plates naturally. And then those doors that were going to be panics, like three sixes, you know, we would have 86 edge is what we'd have. And then you'd get a filler. That's the bottom line. I um, mean, Kawhi did a really good job with all of that, I must say. They also had an excellent team of customer service folks. Um, the customer service lead, her name was Donna. I unfortunately forget her last name. That's I have spoken to Donna over the years so many times, but I can't remember her last name. But I know that she retired, um, which is where the story will end up to a certain extent. Um, they had, uh, in engineering, it was Tom Field was the head of engineering. And what's interesting about that is he was one heck of a smart individual. That the um, if it if you needed to know whether or not Kawani could do something, he was obviously the man to talk to. He was the person who was going to tell you whether or not it was possible. Uh, Tom Field. He wrote. He was the author of the Kawani technical manual. Kawani always had two books. They had the price book and then they had the technical manual. The technical manual was a nightmare. Um, the technical manual is something that in today's terms I don't believe there's anyone who works in this industry that would have been able to gravitate towards it and learn it. I did. Um, I was extremely passionate. I remain extremely passionate about the industry. Um, and the fact that the manual was written by someone who has an engineering background um, 
made it a challenge. I have no idea where the old engineering manuals went to that we had. They've been gone for who knows how long. Um, obviously, um, I wish I had that just for keepsake purposes. It'd be nice to know, you know, nice to be able to show that to people. And then, of course, the price book. And they were both like three inch binders, so they were pretty epic documents um, in and of themselves. So, early in my career, I wasn't really getting involved in anything custom because I didn't. I didn't even know the difference between right hand and left hand reverse at that time. I really, I was oblivious. It took me two years before that made sense. It did though, one day it just came to me. Um, I feel like I didn't drill that deep enough. This is brass, so it it's easy to drill. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I did. I certainly did drill it deep enough. Okay. Um, but as my skill grew, and I dealt with customers that required a different perspective on what was being sold, meaning I wasn't here anymore to just get your money and load you up with 18 gauge 3070s for that strip mall that you're building. I wanted to see the plans and specs. And that's going to call for D-series doors, that's going to call for unusual hinge preps, that's going to call for unusual gauges and types of construction. That's going to call for advanced hardware preparations. So learning the manual, of course, became required, or at least being able to navigate it and wield it correctly. So a lot of times, you know, I, I most absolutely spoke to Tom Field on the telephone, lots of times, because he was the guy. Donna was very good, too, um, extremely good. Um, there were times you didn't need to talk to Tom because Donna knew it. Um, not unusual. She was really, really good. Um, there were other people who worked there in terms of customer service. Um, Lindsay is a name that I think that I remember. But the name that um, is most definitely still associated with our industry is Rose Cliff. Rose came from the back of Kalani. This was probably, Rose probably came on the scene in maybe 1990. Oh, I don't recall. Maybe the, maybe 95, 96, 97, 98, somewhere in there. Well, Rose, the way the story goes is that she literally started in the back, sweeping. I don't know that she was actually sweeping. I, uh, she probably worked on the frame or door line. It's probably the truth. Um, but she is literally a person who came from the ground level. She is now the director of education for Asa Abloy for their hollow metal Seco brand, probably Curry's as well. Um, so she is a super success story. Very nice lady as well. I actually spoke to her on the phone about two years ago. I was in a Seco training class and uh, I was like I am now talking about the old Kiwani days and they looked at me and they said, yeah, Rose is the director of education for ASA. And 
they dialed her up and we, we chatted on the phone. <laughs> we quite frankly just reconnected about the old days. It was really nice to speak to her again. Yeah, that moved on me. So those were the door types that they had, the D and the VMAX. There was no other door. Kalani also, uh, of course, did hollow metal frames. They had the, the masonry in the drywall. They had the F series. Just, you know, you could guess that's going to be masonry. So an F416 would be a 16 gauge typical frame. Um, they had the PF, which is what they call the panel fit, which is the knockdown drywall frame. So, in those instances where the studs and drywall are already up, because they couldn't wait for the, they, well, they didn't order the material on time, or the distributor didn't have them in stock, who knows what the, what the real situation is, doesn't matter. Um, you could order a knockdown panel fit, the PF. Now, my grandfather made the claim, and I, of course, am extremely suspect of this claim, that he came up with the idea for the panel fit and told Jack Regan about it at some point in the 70s. Who knows? Or the 80s. Now, Jack Regan was a national sales manager. He was a character in the sense of that man um, was a walking encyclopedia of the industry. Uh, he was replaced in sometime in the 90s late 90s by Tom Barnard and Tom was with Kiwani and he was a uh, I know that he knew Fred Pippin outside of work I know that they um, they were uh, Tom actually may have been a friend in a social circle with Fred Pippin first relate or revolving around the boating world but Tom when Jack Regan retired became the national sales manager knowledgeable uh, man about hollow metal. Uh, and actually, when I took my training class with Kiwani, which I think was two and a half days, uh, in Kiwani, Illinois, which is you know, roughly two and three quarter hours uh, west and a little bit south of, of Chicago. Um, But my grandfather said that he told said said to Jack Regan, "You need to make a, door, a frame like this because what do I do when uh, the wall the drywall's already up?" And he uh, he um, took claim for that. You know how how truthful or honest that is. I don't know Jack Regan. I'm I know is no longer with us. Um, anyway, so they had the two frames: the panel fit and the the F line. And of course with hollow metal frames you can do anything you need to do to them, including make panel fits out of masonry. If you needed to, if you didn't have any drywall frames in stock, you could take an F line, you could install compression anchors up into the header. Pardon me, up into the top of each jam. You could cut out the floor anchors and you'd have a panel fit, roughly. The problem with that is you're gonna have mortar guards over everything. And you are not going to have um, backbend returns, which is what you want on drywall frames. It makes slipping over the drywall easier. So backbend returns are, you could argue, are, are, are necessary. If you give a client a frame without backbend returns, one out of 50 people are going to complain that it ripped the face of the drywall when they were putting it on. Um, yeah, it, it, it can, especially if that wall is too fat. It's going to do that. So, those are the two frame types. Now, Kiwani also did... So, Kiwani could make you anything. They could do polystyrene. They could do honeycomb. They could do polyurethane. They could do um, steel stiffened. They could do um, UL. Uh, they were, I think, factory mutual as well. They could label everything. They could obviously do borrowed lights. They also did escape 
window wells, the corrugated steel that you'd have in a window well escape from a basement. They made those in their Galva plant, which was so many miles south of Kiwani. Um, so that that's interesting. Those also came from Kiwani. Uh, they had a roll former there, which I don't recall what they were roll forming. It may have had something to do with the Galva plants, you know, more residential material. They weren't roll forming frames. And the way that Kiwani manufactured their material was with shears and press brakes, like any other manufacturer. You would cut the steel to the right size, and then you would put it into a press brake. I've been to the plant several dozens of times uh, and was, you know, physically in the plant in the back several dozens of times, dozens, probably over a hundred, and know exactly how that material is manufactured. And Kiwani always made a really nice product. One thing that was nice about Kiwani that, that we did not like about other manufacturers is Kiwani's doors were at least initially, and really till, you know, it got to a point maybe, maybe 10 years or five years before they ceased operations that you had to request the doors being fully wrapped in cardboard. That's the way we got doors from Kiwani. They were fully wrapped in cardboard. We loved it because it kept the doors protected and made them look perfectly pristine from the factory when the client picked them up. Not just edge cardboard where you've got every opportunity under the sun to scratch that material. Um, even before your customers picked it up. So fully wrapped cardboard was always super nice. Um, if you're going to do any preparations to it, yeah, you'd have to cut it out of, the out of the cardboard, but you could put it right back in the cardboard when you were done. So, in 1991, at some point, I went to, I think it was, it was cold outside, so I think it was late winter of uh, 1991. So it would have been maybe March of 91. And uh, sat out there with Tom Barnard leading the class for two and a half days. The, I mean, it was intensive. I mean, we went over everything possible when it comes to hollow metal. There's no doubt. Well, well, what we did was we went through the price book uh, completely. And then we went through the technical manual. And I don't recall how complete that was, but you left there with the ability to know how to navigate their book. And then I think the half day was at the plant and lunch, that kind of thing. So it was, go out to Kiwani, they put you up in a hotel. Uh, in that hotel, they had a room where Tom Barnard hosted the class. And you sat there and went through the book. It was, it was, it was not teaching you hollow metal in the sense of selling it or understanding it. It was, it was most definitely, here's hollow metal this is how you order it from us. It was it was definitely teaching you how to how to work with Kalani, but you know those two r results, learning hollow metal and learning Kalani, they're 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 not mutually exclusive. You know, one obviously helps the other. Um, and I came back to work. Um, first of all, I was 
ridiculously thrilled, I don't know if my dad was, that I was basically on vacation is what it felt like for me and, and, and working at the same time. My dad missed me just being on the counter, meaning he missed a pair of hands. But I came back with a uh, very confident level of knowledge over the manufacturing process. And I was brimming with excitement, anticipation. I was ready to conquer the world because I now possessed knowledge about how the factory did it. And I did not need to be concerned about that anymore, meaning if you're trying to sell access control and a guy calls you and says, you know, you sold me this $500 electromagnetic lock and it doesn't work. It's doing the same thing the old one did. If you don't know how to troubleshoot that on the phone, which by the way, it turns out he had nine volts coming out of his power supply. Um, so that's, that was, he's like, he said, you know, it works. It's just, I can push the door open with putting my shoulder into it. So the point of all of, of me saying this is if, if you're not comfortable in being able to take ownership, you know, if you're like me, yeah, you're going to feel compromised. You're not going to feel confident to be able to sell the material. Uh, you know, these contractors, they expect you to be the expert. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the expert. I mean, if you spend enough time in this industry, you're going to get to know things. And you're going to get to know a lot more about these things than most other people ever will learn. And I did have to say to a customer who was giving me the razzmatazz the other day that we had shipped him the wrong thing, and it turns out he ordered the wrong thing. You know, at a certain point, you have to say to people, I've forgotten more about hardware than you've ever learned. Um, but when you have that confidence to be able to understand the process, you can monetize that. And that's what that trip to the to the uh, to Kiwani did for me. The the, the uh, training. That's what that did for me. So I came back ready to roll, ready to ready to sell doors, and 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 sell doors I did. And uh, that was '91. And so what happened between '91 and let's say '95? Let's say '91. It got to a point where also <clears throat> um, this is completely apolitical, but there was a correlation between Clinton being president and people making money. Times were good under Clinton, and this, these were the Clinton days, and the amount of doors that we ended up stocking became never enough. The frequency with which we were ordering new, new truckloads, forgive me, let me back that up. We were in a 3,000 square, 3,000, we were in a 2,200 square foot building at 6103 West Montrose with no loading dock and a 4x8 overhead door in the back which we never opened and we were taking pup trailers because that's the only thing that could fit on the street so every time we ordered from Kiwani it had to be a pup trailer which Kiwani didn't appreciate uh, having to special order those for us the frequency of ordering those pup trailers was definitely on the on the rise um, 91, 92 93 got into trying to have the doors on hand that the customer may ultimately end up needing um, maybe getting a little braver with what we would stock maybe keep some 16 gauge galvanized well that's a leap guy comes in he wants a heavy he had he had the seco regent and rusted on him and he's not going to use that anymore how about this how about if i get you a d-series 16 gauge galvanized whoa what's galvanized so now we can sell it because now we know what it is and uh toss a couple of those into the in, in, you know and then what goes with what goes with 16 gauge doors well 14 gauge frames You know, like anything else, you're going to have customers that are the cheapest in the world. I get that. You're going to have customers that 
are the exact opposite. They want the best they can get their hands on. I had a guy order for me a D414 one time, a 14 gauge D series door. This thing, and it was only a 2870, and it was epic in its weight. It was preposterous. And this gentleman was doing something odd. With this door in the sense that he was going to attach to the face of the door, to the secured side of the door, which was the outside. It was a left hand, I think. He wanted a heavy gauge because he was going to attach with screws wood paneling to the outside. So he wanted that really thick skin. And of course, we made it galvanized. Of course, we made it polyurethane because that would give him the best R value. Um, and he came in with a sketch for us to drill about, I don't know, a hundred holes in the face of the door that he was then going to apply stuff to. He come in to pick the door up and I was so pleased it was done, a heavy door and I've got all this Kiwani knowledge and knew exactly how to sell him the material. He's like, you've got the holes on the wrong side of the door. I says, no, I don't. You ordered a left hand. I said, yes, I need a left hand. And uh, it turns out I told Daniel to drill all the uh, holes on the pole side of the door. Very nice gentleman. He basically said, listen, it doesn't matter. The gauge of the steel is so thick. Weld all those holes closed. Grind them, bondle them if you have to. It's perfect. And he allowed us to do that. I should have just ordered him a new door because of the labor time alone, but it was more of a lead time at that point, right? The point of the matter is that mistake aside, which happen, I mean, they're infrequent, but they do happen. Um, when you've got that knowledge, you can really, really do things, do things confidently. And Kiwani's training class, again, allowed that to happen. So we continue to build our inventory of these items. We get braver about what we stock because you've got someone now, me is who I'm talking about, that's just not trying to fill an opening, trying to find out what you need. I'm happy to see you back here again in 10 years when that door's falling apart. But how about if I give you something far more robust? As far as I'm concerned, galvanized should be every door because it's very low hanging fruit in terms of cost that you're gonna to add to the, to the project. Very, very inexpensive to add galvanized. So through those years, we ended up adding more and more. The trucks ended up coming more often. The pup trailers were also fuller every time. And a pup trailer, I think is about two thirds of the size of a, of a full tractor trailer, or maybe it's half, I forget, or maybe it's one third. It's not one third, but. Um, just shaking out the filings. Um, we did shop work naturally, welding, deadbolt preps, uh, different preparations for frames for um, attaching them, obviously pipe anchors, very typical, very common. Um, of course, T anchors. Uh, we could do all that stuff right in the shop, our little shop. It got to a point where our shop guy had no chance of keeping up with the demand. And he was not extremely thrilled with all of the additional work because it was just additional work. I then in 90 three or four, I re-enrolled in junior college. Well, I was still enrolled. Um, and I took a welding class. And I did that because I knew that I needed to relieve the pressure on the one guy. And my, my father was not going to allow me to hire another another shop, shop uh, person. Uh, not only just because uh, of maybe what might be the obvious reason, um, but we had no room for two people, even though I felt that we did. So I went to 
uh, went back to Triton College in River Grove, Illinois, and they had a welding class. And I didn't care about the final. I wasn't there for the grade. I just needed to know how to do it. And, and that I did. We started with oxyacetylene. And uh, that was a challenge. But long story short, I became proficient when it came to welding. Uh, obviously, MIG welding is what it was. And we were not MIG welding when I started. We were um, arc welding. And that was just not going to work. Because you're really challenged with material thickness. So the MIG welder, flux core wire uh, MIG welder, allowed us to really get into the thin gauge of a 16 gauge much better. Because we could, we could handle that a lot better. Okay. So Kiwani just continued through those years producing material. Good quality, really good quality material. The value was incredible with material that you'd get from Kiwani. I remember 3070 doors were $152, 18 gauge VMAX, ready to go, in stock. You can get an opening out the back door for $330, hinges, lock, frame, knockdown frame. Everyone was super happy. So we could supply you with a Kiwani VMAX. We could also kick it up a notch and pull in some D-Series, which I did end up keeping more in stock. And in all of these years, I continued to be intimately involved with the operations at Kiwani in terms of several and many visits um, and learning just how the process worked, learning how doors are, are made. Sheet steel comes in. A coil, forgive me, a coil, well, sheet steel can come in too, which they would do, let's say they would have their mill supply the sheets for 3070s, where you know 95% of everything you sell is a 3070, and all they had to do is put them in the press break and turn them into pans. Um, so a coil of steel would come in, and they're going to you know, uncoil it, they're going to shear it to length, they're going to shear it to the width, and they are uh, going to put it on their turret, or CNC turret, they're going to punch all the holes necessary in it, or the fixed um, tooling that would do that, the large presses, um, to the press break after everything's bent. And then it would go to get hardware reinforcements welded in. It would then go to the prime, it would go, it would go to the paint line where it's an overhead system and there are hooks and this material is hung. You see weird, weird holes in hollow metal, it's because they need to hang the material. It would go through the paint booth. It would come out the other end finished. And that's how that worked. It would then come off the hooks it would get stacked into carts, and it would get sorted for customers' orders. And in that area, the back of that area was the shipping department. The back of the paint line was basically the shipping department. And Kiwani had a very large area there, several thousand square feet of staged orders. It was also where the truck dock obviously was. So the Tractor trailers would pull up, it would get off the paint line, packaged, sorted, tagged, etc. And that would be that. I religiously use lubricant for cutting. I find that it, my tool life goes up substantially. Kiwani did a, a very interesting thing. Yeah, this is no good. I was going to do it freehand, and I realized that's a bad idea. Kwani did an interesting thing. Every time they loaded a truck, they took a Polaroid. And I mean, when I mean a Polaroid, I mean a Polaroid. It comes out the front of the camera. 
and they put that with the file because freight damage was an issue. Freight damage today is an epic issue. So if the material showed up and it was destroyed, they pulled out that Polaroid and said, didn't leave here that way. We actually do that as a rule on shipments, certainly those that are going international or anything of high value, we'll, we'll take photographs. Um, so if the carrier does anything to it, we know, we know how it left. I would encourage you to do the same. And um, I forget the name of the gal that was in the shipping area, uh, but she started work really early, like 4 o'clock. And we, you know, it was just all pup trailers is what it was. And it worked out really well. So I realized I'm not talking about the history of Kiwani as much as I am rambling on. But let's, let's talk about Kiwani a little bit. Kiwani was a hollow metal door manufacturer that I, I know that they had a different name at some point. They were owned by different people um, until Fred Pippin bought them. He came from, without, from, from outside of the industry. He, he was not an industry person, but he, but he was a businessman. So he saw an opportunity to obviously run a business into a successful situation, I imagine, is what he had in mind. I hope that's deep enough. And they were in Kewanee, Illinois, as I said earlier. Not very far from Chicago, as I said earlier. And they had, I don't recall the size of the building. It was probably every bit of 80,000 square feet or something like that. Many, many people worked there. Different, you know, some people were on the door line, the frame line, the paint line, etc. Yeah, it appears to be deep enough. And when you approached Kewanee, uh, you would go out 80, and I think you'd go south on 78 for so many miles. May have been about 12 miles, and you'd go south. And you would get to whatever that road, Burlington, I think was the name of the road. It was, there was a shell station there. You'd make a right-hand turn on. That's how you knew you were there. Well, you'd go down Burlington, and you would end up making a left-hand turn, or gentle sweep to the left, to the south, actually. And uh, you would come up eventually on the west side of the street, a very large parking lot, and then a one-story red brick building, and that was Kiwani. Uh, the docks, as you continued south, there was, in that parking lot, there were, a, the I believe it was a... Probably a single door, if I if I recall correctly. Uh, employee entrance. Uh, there was, as you continued past the parking lot, you got to the front of of the building where visitors, or maybe office staff, certainly office staff and visitors would enter. And then past that, continuing south, you would get to the truck docks. Where there was a man door, etc. So when you came in the front door of Kiwani, you came into a vestibule area, and then that inner vestibule door would open. And as soon as you walked in, Fred's office was immediately to the left. You had literally the corner office situation. Um, when you walked in, and then to the right would be the pool of customer service. Engineering, customer service was all in there, and cubicles, that whole. A whole cubicle thing. Uh, actually, I think it was customer service first, accounting, and then I think engineering was in the back. I forgot where Tom sat. I think he'd sat in different desks. Uh, and another gentleman that was in engineering as well. And I could walk in. I could see Donna. Um, and everyone else. I forget the other names. This has been... 
25 years. And what would take me out to Kiwani would be, quite frankly, picking material up. Got to a point where we would collect material out there. The reason we started doing that, I think, was because shipping charges were starting to get really astronomical. Like, they had gone up substantially. Also, we found it was easier to get the material we needed when we needed it, if we took it in smaller doses because we could send a large stock order to Kiwani and the 3668s, they're back ordered. That means my 83070 VMAX doors are also back ordered and that's not going to work. So we would take smaller loads. So taking what would take me out to Kiwani would be the fact that I'd be picking material up. But to say that I've been in every inch of that building I think would be pretty accurate. As soon as you went into customer service, there was a door out to the plant back there, and obviously it was a plant, so safety glasses, of course, were required. Back then, you'd be in the frame area. And if you, can, if you walked and then made an immediate left, you'd get down to the door area and then towards the dock. If you went to the back of the building and then to the south a little bit, you would end up getting to the paint area. And they had their fabrication in the shop back there as well, where you had three people just welding, cut, fabricating. And you'd see dozens of frames stacked up. And it was always neat to go out to the plant to see what they were doing, because they weren't doing 3070 F416s like we were with pipe hangers. They were doing epic borrowed light walls. They were doing all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, so it was fun going out to the plant to see that, to see it in action, so to speak, all those times. Um, and that's pretty much my memory of the back of the shop, or the back of the plant. Um, simple and straightforward. You know, parking lot was across from the docks, where you would, could enter the front of the building if you were, you know, front office or if you were a guest. Kalani. Uh, back then had a Colorado warehouse and the reason they had a Colorado warehouse is because they could get stuff shipped out to California easier when they already had it halfway across the country huh took one out of order um, occasionally we needed stuff so severely that we had it shipped out of Colorado to us and I've had Kiwani make pretty much everything that could be made short of specialty material. Obviously no stainless, no bullet resistant. Um, I did have them make a lead line door for me one time. I got the impression that they didn't do those often themselves either. Uh, but Jack Regan was quite the expert. He understood the industry, and I'll tell you, and I, I'm not going to tell you whether or not I agree with him, but at his retirement, or when he was retiring, he said to me, take it from me, learn a lesson from me, he said, don't work so many hours. He says, I was always working, always on the road, I didn't, and he said, I missed my daughters growing up, or daughter, I forget what he said, exactly, um, you know, work-life balance, that's tough for everyone so find your happy medium I suppose and um, what was good about Jack was that he was dependable he was reliable he was knowledgeable he could call the plant and make things happen um, and they were very lucky to have him in my opinion and Tom Barnard was good I'm sure that he is still good I understood that he went to Pioneer I haven't spoken to him in probably a dozen years, if not more. Um, but there's definitely, definitely a generation, Jeff, de generational change when Jack retired, um, which I think I identify myself more with an, the older generation, just because that's how I started. Uh, even though Tom Barnard was there, and you know, running the class that I took, he was the class.
believe that Kiwani was owned in the 1970s by a company called AMF, a name that's not. I'm, I'm, I'm I would, I'm, I'm not speculating. I think that's what their name was, and that's from that's who I think Fred Pippin bought the company from. But the moral of the story with Kiwani is they made a very good quality door at a very economical price, and. Tom Barnard, I know this because he told me, back in the second half of the 90s, 97, 98, 99, 98, 99, 2000, they were making drastic price changes to their product line. Drastic. Prices were going up by 30%. That was quite shocking. And obviously addressing this with the national sales manager, Tom Barnard, his response, and he wasn't wrong, he says, we make the best quality door out there, and we should charge for it. And I said, you do make the best quality door out there. But you are not going to get a contractor who specializes in the cheapest strip malls in Chinatown where he needs the If there were doors thinner than 20 gauge, he would want those. Chinatown, you pick, you pick the neighborhood in Chicago. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. I says, Tom, that guy does not care about the quality of your door. He cares about, well, we all care about the same thing, but he, there's no acknowledging the quality of the door with that type of client. And I said, well, that's why you have the D-door, okay? You have those customers, That's you're going to sell them your D-door, because that's that's the one. The VMAX, you can't pump that price because it's while it's an exceptional door, you have to compete. If people out there much bigger than you competing... Well, that price situation, I was not able to change any of that, nor was anyone. And the price did go up, and the price to the customers did go up, and it didn't, you know, I can't really say that it had a drastic effect on our business, but within six years, Kiwani was out of business. And I went through the 90s with Clinton. Those were very good times. I went through the dot-com bust. Those were very bad times. Uh, I don't recall the year that Kiwani pulled the plug. It may have been 2008. The point of 2008 is I was also there in the housing crisis. Those were the worst of times. There were Black, there were black Fridays and Black Mondays, that's for sure. Um, so whatever the reasons were, Kiwani filed bankruptcy. All of their stuff was auctioned. And that was it. I know that Rose, we all we all know, because I said it earlier, Rose absolutely landed on her feet. Donna retired. I'm quite sure that Fred would have retired. He was certainly of retirement age. Shoot. Um, I know that Tom Field went to Mesker, and that was the hollow metal line that we carried. Uh, after. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was Mesker. We were looking at Amweld, but it ended up being Mesker because they were more like Kiwani to me. A good, decent quality door in their NP, NP series, NP418 maybe, I forget. Uh, it seemed like it was a good quality door, uh, decently priced. Guy could buy a door and frame and not have to, you know, there wasn't that kind of sticker shock. And unfortunately, that legacy of Kiwani has all but disappeared. I have some descriptions of their doors and their frames on my website, but I don't. I can't find any of my old manuals, my old catalogs, um, and nor is there anyone around today that talks about Kiwani. And you have to be nowadays an old timer to even know their name. Now Kiwani was, you would find their material in California very occasionally, but if someone had a hollow metal door in Chicago or in or in Illinois or in the immediate Midwest, yeah, it could have been Kiwani. Because that's where they were located. It also could have been Fenestra. Certainly could have been Seco. Seco had their... They were headquartered in uh, Oakbrook at one point. Back in the 50s is when my family uh, first starting started selling hollow metal doors. It was my grandfather going to Seco and picking up at their location somewhere... I don't know. 30... 3,000 south and maybe... 4,000 West, I'm completely guessing. It was somewhere like that kind of situation. Now, if I've drilled and tapped everything correctly, we're going to be in good shape. 
to just do the mechanical connecting of this, these parts. Now what has me concerned about these cylinders and the cams is I wasn't the sale per salesperson who sold these. But the guy started out asking for Schlage. Well, the Schlage standard cam is not going to be a standard cam, so we're going to have to address that. This material is being overnighted to California, to Sacramento. We've got to make sure that we've got the right stuff going on here. Um, okay. I'm going to pause this video and I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to continue on talking about Kiwani. Now Kiwani had a full offering of um, stick material as well. So you would certainly be able to build anything you needed out of stocking stick material, which we didn't at all um, because there was no need for that stuff until I started and you know, after a couple of years realized we need to be able to make side light frames. We need to be able to make drywall frame, um, borrowed lights. And what's interesting about borrowed lights is you can take a panel fit header and an F-line header because of the welded in miter guides on the panel fit frames, those would fit together just perfectly. You can get some pony clamps and you could just make borrowed lights out of header. So if you were doing borrowed lights that had IDs of 202426282103436384050, 60, 70 if you kept them, 80, had those headers, you did not have to get into a lot of work to make broad lights. You put those headers together and it worked perfectly. The downside of that is you had backbend returns on two of the backbend returns on two of the sides where you didn't on the others. Yeah, that stuff's got to come out. Um, never proved to be a problem for us making brown lights that way, by the way. But stick material obviously is going to be available in. I can see you want to come out. Is obviously going to be available in all of the different frame depths as well as cu custom jam depths. I said frame depths, but jam depths obviously. Um, so, you know, later on with Mesker, I ended up stocking all the jam depths, including six and a, uh, seven and a quarter, seven and an eighth, you know, six and five, just weird throat sizes. Because Chicago is an old place, and you're going to see a lot of weird wall thicknesses. So stick material we would keep obviously blank, two inch face. Later in the future, I got into stocking F-line jams from Kiwani, 7.0, hinge and strikes with two inch, obviously two inch, inch and three quarter, inch and a half, inch and one quarter, and one inch. And that's a great way when a guy says, yeah, I need a 307, but my, my rough opening is only 39 and three quarter. Well, you are not gonna make a 3.0 fit in that, my friend, no sir. So you'd have these jams there, and it's an opportunity to make more money, is the bottom line. You know, they didn't cost you that much more, because you're going to order six at a time, or whatever it was. But back to the stick material, blanks, obviously. Now, in hinge jams, we'd stock 6, 8, and 7, 0. Oh. Um, strike jams, obviously. Just the different hands of that material, because it was uh, Kiwani's unequal rabbit. Um... Mullion, blank mullion. We would have sill, four inch sill. I may have kept a piece of eight inch sill around too, because uh, someone had asked for that. I did a little job. I says, hey, I'll put one on the shelf. It's an option. Um,
strike mullions, hinge mullions, cased material. Um, I forget the length of what that stuff was. Ten foot, ten foot four maybe. I forget the standard length. And we were able, you know, with all those parts, we were absolutely able to put together custom frames. Sketch, piece of paper, pencil. That's how we would do it. It'd be very easy to make that custom stuff. Not hard to make it at all. Uh, and Kawani made it possible to have that material available to us. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. I needed a moment to remember how I did that. Hopefully I won't need the oil again. Kiwani participated routinely in DHI industry events where you could go to DHI and they would be there with their booth. You could meet Donna and Jack or Tom or Fred. Um, I'm sure Rose at some point as well. And I like their logo a lot. Just the word Kiwani. You know, kind of a 70s logo. The word Kiwani was there. Um, and there was just no one like them in the sense that they were just, no, no one that I was familiar with, they were just simple, straightforward people that just wanted to do a good job. And they just did it. They did it all the time and they did it very well. What else to say about Kiwani? Well, um, they were a company that we could always get approved on a job. They always had a product that would work. Sometimes a customer would call and say that his the inspector can't see the label on the frame. This was actually quite common. The frame's not labeled. You told me it was fire rated. It is. No, it's not. It is. Oh, that works smooth. The reason that you get that smooth is using this. Even when you're going to tap that hole, don't freehand it. I freehanded in the past, and it doesn't work real nice. Not to my not to my satisfaction. Kiwani could do, I can see there's, yeah, you know, that stuff's got to come out because your client might need to service this someday. Had the wrong screw there. Still do have the wrong screw. Yeah. Kiwani was generally a company that could absolutely ship very promptly. They could do that continuously. And we never, um, 
We never had need for anyone other than Kiwani. I didn't miss not being able to buy Steelcraft or Curries or Seiko, not once. Um, we sell Seiko nowadays. And uh, that's all fine and well. But it was a simpler time, in my opinion, with Kiwani. Um, because of how, because of their approach, and I don't know how what of their approach contributed to them going out of business. I, I don't know what you know were, were there larger market factors at play that really did them in. You know, did the did, did they get in trouble with a major customer of theirs not paying? Um, did the price increases? basically turn off customers to the point where people aren't buying their material like they used to. Um, you know, I know Amweld obviously went out of business as well, so it's hard to really know the truth. That might not work. No, it won't. Need a little more depth on that one hole. Kwani was always very accommodating. If they could do it, they would do it for you. And I do like to believe that that's what set them apart from their competition. And obviously that's false to say because I don't know. But they did keep it simple and straightforward. If they could do it, they would do it for you. Every time. Like I said, there was no reason to go to anyone else. Now. I was told by my father that um, he liked Jack Regan. Uh, pardon me. I was told by my father that my great grandfather liked Jack Regan a lot. And it's because Jack Regan was involved, perhaps in some sort of organization that my great grandfather was partial to or sympathized with. Whereas with other reps, Bob Julier is a name. He was the Hager rep in the 70s, 80s, and 90s for sure. Got to know Bob Julier so well that he was at my wedding. My great-grandfather didn't care for Bob Julier. Slick, Cadillac driving, briefcase. Bob Julier was in there trying to sell him Hager, get him off of whoever they were selling. Briefcase, calculator, Grandfather, great-grandfather comes out of the office, sees it, grabs the briefcase without saying a word, much less hello, throws his briefcase into the middle of the street, says, get out, don't want your stuff. And that's just who that was. The point of saying that is Jack Regan was a special person because you were dealing with someone that wouldn't hesitate to throw your stuff out in the middle of the street, is the, is the point of that story. The downside of Kiwani packaging their doors in cardboard is you couldn't load them on pallets. Um, you couldn't palletize them because they were on cardboard. And we got to a point where um, we could take, you know, you can only take so many doors in a pup trailer when they're in cardboard. The other downside of that is you have to unload them by hand, obviously. And that, it would, you know, on a good day, we could probably do it in three and a half hours, unload a pup trailer. Me, my brother, Daniel, and Kurt, if it was all four of us. And it wasn't always all four of us, that's to be sure. Kurt may have had something so important um, that he needed to be keying locks or on the counter. So that would certainly take him away from what we were trying to do, meaning get a truck unloaded in the 17 degree weather or the 92 degree weather, whatever it was. 
but I was also in my early 20s and unloading a truck, a trailer's worth, a pup trailer's worth of doors and frames. I didn't need anyone's help. I, I, I just do it myself. Um, and plus, we were all walking through that six foot, that 3670 opening. And that's hard to be able to carry material through a doorway like that, even though it's oversized. That's just how it was. Um, one really nice thing about Kiwani compared to how it's done today, and I still get away with it, even though it works to my disadvantage, I think, with some manufacturers. Um, my quick ship people, I use carp and steel. I use, um, obviously, Seco. They still allow me to just write it out the way that I would write it out. Flush hollow metal door. 307 oh, inch and three quarter, 90 minute. Um, you know, specify the core type, specify any options, specify how it's prepped, specify how it's uh, reinforced, specify with the hand. Uh, you know, just like the way DHI would have you write out a piece of hardware. Um, Kiwani took the orders, and this is Jack Regan. He says, We'll take the order on the back of a napkin. You know, I, those may not have been his exact words, but that is definitely Jack Regan. Um, really just kept it simple and straightforward for you. Um, that's really not the case nowadays where you need to use order forms. Order forms are a drag. I don't know your system. I don't want to know your system. I just want you to take what I have and send me what I'm asking for. And the reason they use order forms is because there are people in order entry who are great individuals, they're not hollow metal people. They're not ever going to be hollow metal people because that's not their, that's not what they do. Um, and that's what, that's a, that's one thing that Kiwani was, you know, just something that they were really great at. They would take orders, literally, just written out. I want 20 VM418 3070, uh, and then you would tell them, uh, SC, I think, is what their code was for a 161. I think I think it was just SC is all it was. I don't remember what it was for a mortise lock or an uh, 86 edge. Um, but one great thing about them is that they really did allow you to work with them. And they wanted to work with you as well. For some reason, I got I got too many parts left over, and I don't know why. Some of these pieces must have come with more screws than I needed. I don't know why I have so many of these machine screws. Um, oh, you know why? Because I've I'm reusing, I'm reusing, I'm reusing a total of ten. They supplied them with the drive cams and with the extenders, so I should have 10 left over when I'm all done. I think this thread is a 348, is what it might be. Don't quote me, but I think it's a 348. Um, the largest job that I did with Kiwani would have been, in terms of hollow metal, it wouldn't have been difficult. It just would have been, I think they were called the high, I know that they were called the Highlands of Lombard. We did, we went through probably three or four complete factory order cycles of material. There were hundreds of VM418 3070s on that job, hundreds that I supplied. Um, five by 20s for the stairwells flush for everything else, polystyrene, core, super simple, super straightforward. Uh, and getting that material from Kalani was easy. It was, it should have been, I would imagine, I hope it would have been extremely profitable for them because it wouldn't have been very difficult to manufacture, but they had the people up front and that's what separate, separated them, the Donna. 
and Rose being very aggressive about wanting to learn the business. Donna was, you know, that encyclopedia that I had mentioned. And uh, as I had said earlier, you didn't often need to get past her to Tom Field to find out if something could be done. Now, I don't know what has come of them in terms of the building or the machinery. This was many years ago, um, and it was quite a sad day, it w you know, that they were going out of business. Now, it wasn't sad in the sense that I couldn't buy steel doors anymore because, as I had said earlier, Mesker was all too happy to um, take your business. And they had a man there by the name of Leroy Jackson, I think his name was, um, and he was their national sales manager. And if I haven't said it already, that's where Tom Field ended up going to when he left when, when Kiwani was finished. He was he was an engineering at Mesker, and he left the part of Illinois that he lived in and went down to Alabama, and he returned to Illinois because he, for whatever reason, he just didn't, he was just too accustomed to living in Illinois, I think, whatever that means. Maybe the climate, maybe he missed the cold, I, I don't know. I mean, I've been to Huntsville. They're extremely nice people that are there. I, I, I don't know what would have caused him to, you know what, I think he may have retired, actually, and just moved back to Illinois where his family is. I actually think that's what happened. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, it makes sense. I've got ten screws left over. Okay. Um, now, Leroy Jackson, he was... Uh, he came in and cleaned up a lot of business that Kiwani left on the table. <clears throat> and he his whole shtick was this. I think he basically said, we are going to make Mesker doors to your, if you're a Kiwani distributor and you're looking, you got to do something, listen, for as long as you need, we'll put the, we'll put the material, we'll put the hinge and lock locations at Kiwani for you, no charge. Uh, we don't want to do it forever, but we'll do it to get you transitioned, uh, is what he said. Um, also, what he said was, I want you to put in a hundred thousand dollar stock order with us. In the world of hollow metal, that's a lot of material. But in the world of hollow metal, that's not necessarily a lot of material. If you're going to gear up and be someone, you're going to have a hundred thousand. And he says, "I'm going to give you six months to pay it back." And he said, "Liz, he, what he said was, if you're not doing seventeen thousand a month of hollow metal, well, then you're not a hollow metal distributor because six times seventeen is going to put you at a hundred grand, or whatever it is. I forget, you know." Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and that's just where he came from. And yeah, we uh, we went down and did the tour there as well. And, and it didn't work out with Amweld, but it did with Mesker. Um, but Kiwani was a company that I very much miss. If they were in business today, I can tell you that they would be my only... Well, I do I like everyone I work with. That's to be sure, but if Kiwani was in business today, that's who I'd be buying my doors and frames from. Just because I'm sentimental and old-fashioned, I suppose. Um, this video may grow into other people participating. It may grow into other um, parts. Uh, there may be additional videos uploaded if I come across people that can shed more light on the history of Kiwani, or at least from their perspective, as I've kind of related mine, um, we'll amend that. And we've been doing all of this while you've been watching me make these custom cylinders. This, it's a Saturday, the uh, last Saturday in February 2020, and this is going to be in California Monday, uh, Tuesday morning. Two-inch mortise cylinders. I just made five of them. The one over here that I don't have the thumb turn, it's a three inch. So yeah, why, why about these? Well, you've got an unusual thick door, most likely. Or it's because you are placing the lock in an unusual location in an unusually thick door. This one over here that I uh, can't make today is, um, I think we have like a three and seven eighths thick door. There you go. I hope uh, some of that in information on Kiwani was even reasonably interested, uh, interesting, and if you have any questions about that or want to chat about any Kiwani old times that you might know and want to share, I am happy to engage in that. Thank you very much.
Okay, well, what proceeds from here is a conversation that becomes quite off-topic and rambling. There's a little more information in there regarding Kiwani. Um, so, you know, it's pretty much in the front part. If I didn't know if we were going to talk more about Kiwani, so I kept the recording going. And that was my father, by the way, who um, worked in the family business for sure full-time since, um, you know, the late 1960s. High school, 66, Vietnam, 67, 68, coming back, and then working 69 all the way up until 2005, um, selling commercial building products. So what follows is his, what, what, what memory is left there, I suppose, of, of Kiwani and his marginal desire to recall. You know, it, it was work. So there you go. Not, not something all of us are necessarily passionate about. Kalani Corporation. It wouldn't take you probably too very long, but what what kind of memories do you have about Kalani that would be... Well, I, re I remember Jack Regan coming into Chicago Builder Supply. Now, I'm not sure if it was 59 or 61 or whatever, but right in that area. And I saw this guy come in and he was dressed up in his suit. And you know, he had a face that looked like it had some kind of an injury. I don't know if you remember his face or not. But... Uh, uh, and he had a, he had a kind of a, a, a lip curl when he smiled, and I went, "Who in the hell is this guy?" He went away and he come back, and he probably did that two or three times. And then one day, I go way out in the back of the store on the north wall, kind of like in the northeast corner, and there's uh, four or five steel doors with four or five steel frames. And I go, what the heck is this? And my dad says, well, yeah, I just brought in a few to see uh, how it's going to go. And <clears throat> he started selling uh, doors and frames. And before we knew it, <clears throat> that whole workshop area that used to be in that corner, before it got moved into the glass block room, was filled with doors and frames. And then, and then that wasn't enough room. And we had to start storing them here and building new places and and. Uh, that's uh, how I remember Chicago Builder Supply getting involved in the hollow metal business. And, of course, Kiwani, uh, Kiwani, Illinois, it was always in the same building that I ever heard of anything about it. I guess it used to be Kiwani Boiler or something like that. I'm a little fuzzy in there. I remember driving the truck out there to make pickups. I remember tractor trailers pulling in on Harlem Avenue and, and on the back of Montrose and all like that. Um, what did you want to know about, you don't want to know about their, the people that worked in the warehouse and stuff like that, right? Because I can't remember, I can't remember their names. Uh, I think I, uh, Gail might have been one of them. It was Donna up front, right? Oh, there's Donna. Yeah, Donna, that's the that's name. Yeah, I did not always talk to her, but on occasion. I know that there was Anita as well. I thought it was Lindsay. It was actually Anita. She was there. Um, Anita, I don't remember, but yeah. yeah. So, um, what what were the doors that were? What was it? Just E series doors? Did Kiwani only make the E and the D? And what year did the V Max come in? Oh my! Gosh, that's so long ago. I think the V Max they started making those when I was on Montrose Avenue. But Dad had the D series doors, um, the D four twenty, and um, what was the other one? An E? Yeah, the E, the E, uh, the, e, the lock seam door, the economy grade door. I don't remember selling many E doors. I don't remember that at all. To tell you the truth, I just remember the D four twenties and D four eighteens, and then the V max doors, which were less expensive. And I think those were. Weren't, weren't they sold those because you could reverse them any which way but loose? Yeah, it was the, not... the hinge locations, top and bottom, the same? Yeah, it was a square edge door. Because it was but square it edge. Welded. Could... It wasn't no. welded, right? There was, you're saying there was no bevel. There was, yeah, there was no bevel and there was no welding in between the two pans on the edge. Whereas the oh. D door was, was welded and then bondoed in the edge. Yeah, well, the, obviously the D door was a better door, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Kiwani helped uh, defray the cost of the outside advertisement I had on the north wall of 6103 West Montrose that advertised Chicago Builder Supply, Kiwani, in the Kiwani blue color. Yeah. Um, um, but when, uh, so that was, who, who owned Kiwani then in, at that time? Cause it wasn't Fred Pippen. He came in later. Oh, and I, I think, have no idea. And I think he, I think Fred Pippen bought it from someone. So Kiwani must've been privately held and then sold to someone. Uh, it's, you know, I never got involved in that until I was on Montrose Avenue. My dad did all of that stuff or, uh, uh, maybe it was uncle George or whatever. I, I honestly, God don't remember. I think though that eventually, well, when my dad went to Florida, I was placing the orders for Kiwani. I'm pretty sure. God, oh what my, did you order? Jambled. I think it was with Jack Regan. What did you what What did you order? What did oh, you order George. that was that was something that you ordered that no one else would order? Did you find a need for something that you that no that Uncle George or Uncle Junior would have kept on, on hand? Regarding Kiwani manufactured items. Yeah, I mean, was there an application? Like, did you? Well, I think um, I think there was a time we talked about getting area walls. You know, the ones that go in the ground around the basement windows yeah, yeah the escape I think window I had walls. some I think I had some of those and um I think once or twice I ordered some kind of window bucks you know like a 10 inch yeah. throat or a 12 inch throat I think I ordered those yeah uh, once or twice special order and I had I did have them do some custom fabrication for uh the Irish American Heritage Cultural Center with a guy by the name of Ambrose Kelly Mm. But who owned, who owned Kamani back in 1965? I have no idea. You know, I was in high school at that time, and up till 1969, I you know I was in the army, and then I came back, and uh, my dad was still there full time. You know, in 1969, to whew, I think he went to Florida around 78, and then he came back in maybe 80, and, and he stayed there till 85, and then he quit forever. I I don't remember and then. You know, Junior had his own place uh, uh, out there in Elk Grove Village. <laughs> I can't think of the name of the place that, that Stanley worked at there. Century Door. Century Door. Century Door. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that uh, you, you have no you have no research uh, uh, satisfaction uh, checking uh, the internet for Kawani Boiler Kawani Manufacturing. Yeah, well, I don't know that Kiwani Boiler had anything to do with the building that they were in, um, but Kiwani, you know, but Kiwani is definitely known for boilers that heat large buildings. And what's interesting in the Blues Brothers scene when they're down in the basement um, with Cab Calloway's character, right behind him, it says Kiwani Boiler on the on the thing. How about that? Minnie the Moocher. Yep. Yep. So are yeah. you at work right now? Yeah, I'm at work. I uh I just finished um making um making uh, turning inch and a quarter mortise cylinders into two inch mortise cylinders is what I just uh finished doing. Oh, is that where you, you can buy some kind of housing that threads onto the back and then it's got another cam? Uh it's kinda of like a shot glass? Kind of, yeah. I mean, you've got to you've got to do a little bit more work. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't just thread on. But yeah, it's you do connect the pieces after you drill and tap the holes in the back of the mortise cylinder. You know, oh. if someone needs you know two inch or two and a half or whatever length, and you need them like now. Um, that's easy. <laughs> I can do that because the the Schlage upcharge, the list upcharge is several hundreds of dollars for a custom length cylinder. Oh man, I bet it. I bet it is. Holy crap! You know wow. they discontinued I, uh, the D series. Huh? Uh, I think you mentioned that to me here about a year ago, yeah. uh, quite some time ago. Anyway, uh, what was the thought behind that? Just weren't selling enough. Apparently, 
it, it's quite wow. a challenge. I was looking for a two. I was looking for a D forty for a two and three quarter inch thick door, equal you know, extended equally. Sergeant, no. Um, Corbin, no. Yale, no. Um, Falcon, no. Schlag, no. Best. Yeah, they'll do it. I got it. I've got it on order with Best. The problem with that is the guy's got Schlag, you know, a Schlag keyway on the job. So if he needs any key functions, he's not going to get a Schlag keyway anymore. Don't doesn't Ilco make a replaceable cylinder for that? No, because Best is small format. Oh. Well, yeah. um, isn't there isn't there some Best keyway that takes a, a, a Schlag C? What's really interesting about that? The answer is no. But what's really interesting about that is the guy who drew. The C keyway, the guy, literally the engineer who invented the Schlage C keyway, worked it best, and the C is the opposite of the best A keyway, which is best standard keyway. It's literally oh, the mirror uh, image of the of their A huh. keyway. But there's no oh, there small go. format core that will take a Schlage C that I have ever heard of. I've never well, come across C, one. The Schlage C keyway's got to be close to a hundred years old, doesn't it? Isn't it? Uh, no, about about eighty, I would guess. I think that was uh, patented maybe. at some point. Um, no, maybe ninety. Um, I, sometime in the early thirties would be my guess. Is when that dude drew that. Um, would be my guess. Wow. Uh, so there is there this is a, a connection fella that made the, Yeah, between the two. Yeah. Wow. I would assume the guy that developed the C keyway that drew it out, he's got to be passed on now. <laughs> I would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that stuff's fun. Are you doing research? Doing research for your book? Um, in a certain regard, I am. Yes. Uh, the well, the one I'm writing now is, uh, as you know, the electrified hardware one. Um, yeah, that's that's intense. Oh my god. Well, yeah, but it, you know, a guy called me yesterday. Uh, earlier this week, actually, and said, hey, that electromagnetic lock you sold me, it's not working right. I can just push the door open. It's like a $500 electromagnetic lock. And I'm like, okay. He's like, it's doing the same thing that the old one did. And so it's either two defective units or it's clearly not the problem of the magnetic lock. So he's like, you know what the problem is? The circuit board on the inside is different. And I says, well, it does. The circuit board doesn't matter because you could actually just hardwire that. That's a basic model. It's either on or off. Um, and I then I said to him, well, you can push it open. Well, that tells me if I were to supply thir- you know, ten volts to a sixty watt light bulb, it's going to glow, but very dimly. And you're telling me that you can create a magnetic bond, but it's very weak. So it probably tells me you've got a voltage problem. Did you check that? Yeah, I checked it. Turns out he didn't check it, and he's only got nine volts coming to the lock. So huh. there's just not a, there's not enough push, not enough voltage. The point is, is doing all that research allowed me over the phone to put myself in a position where at the end the guy's like saying, "I don't know what I would have done hadn't I called you." So you know, it's psychiatric. Uh, the the application, it's a, it's a psychiatric ward. Those doors need to be locked. Yeah. Was oh, this fella is this fella a locksmith or an electrician or handyman? He's a building engineer. You know, he he's you know, he's gonna be a jack of all trades. He's just he may not possess a knowledge of Ohm's law, you know, he may not know uh, oh, yeah. what to look for. Huh. Um but yeah. It was, uh, yeah, but So what you did know, he do? Go out with some kind of tool and and hook it up to the wires and some kind of a meter to tell them how much yeah. electricity so, was being supplied? Well, yeah, you use your multimeter, you set it to DC voltage, and you put it on your red and black, on your output. Your input, red and black, you uh-huh. can check that for 110 volts. Then your output, you can check that for voltage. It needs to be probably 24 volts. And he measured there, it was only getting only giving out 9 volts. So obviously, he's got some sort of a problem. Um, did he have to put in a new transformer of some kind? Uh, probably not because when it's DC, it would be called a power supply. 
Um, uh-huh. And obviously, the power supply takes AC voltage, so there would be a transformer inside of it. But generally, you're you're going to have to replace the ent- entire power supply. Um, you know, getting a subcomponent is is probably pretty tough. Um, and that's loaded. That's located deep in the throat of the frame, right? No, typically the power supply. Trip? It'd be a it'd be like a twelve by twelve by four inch box, and you'd mount it above what they call the plenum. You know, above the the ceiling height, stick it up, up, up above the ceiling, you know, or somewhere where, where you can't the just wiring get to it. Runs, the wiring runs inside the wall and down the throat of the frame to the strike plate area, right? Uh, yeah, it depends on the lock, but yeah, it's electric strike. Yeah. And what kind of lock is on? Is it a panic device? No, it's an electromagnetic lock. It's a, a magnet. Oh, oh, I see what you're getting. Yeah, yeah, electromagnetic lock. Yeah, that, that, that fell out of my... My memory there for a second. Yeah. So he can actually, when the door is supposed to be locked and the power is supplied, you could actually force the door open because the yeah, magnetic could, attraction. Yeah, it just wasn't huh. strong enough. He wasn't getting the pounds of, um, for, um, he wasn't getting the, the holding strength on the um, magnetic field that is generated from the coil and the magnetic lock. If it's not getting the right voltage, it won't create the proper size magnetic field to draw those two plates together, the armature and the, you know, the magnet. Um, so we you know, were able to determine what was at fault? I mean, was the, the connection misaligned? The door was angled or something was wrong there? Or was it the power supply? The unit was not strong enough? incorrectly wired um why would it, it was su- supply some power but not not enough well process of elimination he he did tell me that the power supply was only putting out nine volts and yeah. you know why that would be the case i'd have to think about but obviously something happened to that power supply where it was no longer producing the proper quantity of volts um huh. yeah i don't uh obviously some part of you know, voltage equals amperage times resistance. That formula changed somehow. Um, maybe the resistance went really high and his current stayed the same, which would have to draw the voltage down. So there could have been some sort of, you know, um, something could have been, you know, preventing the flow of, of electricity. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about that or study it or call someone, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I I was reflecting on Kiwani and how simple it was to buy from them in the sense that, you know, door manufacturers today, they want you to fill out order forms. And that's because their data entry people don't know what they're generally aren't door experts. Um, Whereas with Kiwani, what I remember, what I remember doing was when I, when I got doors in, in stock, I always dated them the date that they were unloaded. So I have a reasonable idea of how long it took to sell a, uh, you know, a, a, a certain size of a door. Yeah. Uh, but I would have a clipboard somewhere in the middle and I would put on there 20 VM 420s, uh, 10 D 420s or whatever, 418s. So I just kept the running inventory and then I just faxed it in or I got yeah. on the phone and I talked to the people in the office, and I said, you know, I need so many six eights and so many seven O's and headers and what all like that. What what did they call it when it was a one sixty one? Was it just VM four eighteen SC? A VM four eighteen, yeah, SC. That rings SC. a bell, yeah. What what was it for for a mortise lock? What they call it? It was ML. It a, I think it was ML. Oh yeah, I think you're right. I think it was ML. Yeah, it may have been ML. Yeah, if you wanted an 86 edge, that's what it was. Yeah. It's crazy how you forget that stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, anyway. Out, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, go ahead. Tell me. I'm standing out in the backyard here by Stephen's um, fish pond or whatever we're going to call this thing. It's a, it's a muck pond. And I'm standing on the pile of dirt that was shoveled out of the fish pond and put into a pile over here. I'm standing on this pile. I'm looking at the house directly to the south across the uh, wooden fence. I, I've never seen anybody in there. I've never seen any lights flashing on or off. I've never seen anybody walk in front of a window. I've never seen anybody drive up and park up or heard any noise at all. 
the roof, the roof has 30 plants growing out of it, out of the roof. There's so much rotting twigs and branches and leaves that the plant life is growing out of the roof. There's a, there is a ornamental plant like you might think of as an avocado tree. It is at least four foot tall growing out of the gutters, what it looks like to me, with, with, with exposed branches over the, over the shingles. Unbelievable. I don't know if somebody's laying in that house dead on the floor or what. Hopefully not. Ah. Hmm. Maybe you should go knock on their door and see what the story is. That could be interesting. I could maybe put a letter in uh, the mailbox. And, cause hey, I do gutter I cleaning. They, I think they would want to know about that. I mean, it's like it's like some kind of old haunted house or something. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you on your birthday, our birthdays. Now, that's everything that can be reasonably recollected about the Kalani Corporation from the fourth generation and the third generation of my family to sell this material. We're now into five generations, and, and the fifth generation will never know anything about Kalani, unfortunately. Um, very high quality doors, I am sure. Um, there must be remnants of people that work there that are still around, and certainly within the industry, of course, Rosecliff. Um, I'm sure Tom Barnard is still uh, working somewhere within the industry. He was extremely, I'm sure still is extremely knowledgeable about hollow metal, but I do miss that high-quality product line that they made. Um, they, they just knew how to do it really well. I'm not sure what they didn't know how to do, um, but the forces that acted on them acted on everyone else as well. So it's really hard to say, but we do miss them. If by any chance you have any uh, memories of Kiwani, please contribute in the comments of this video. I'd very much like to um, read your stories as well. Thank you. Again, thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.